Well, now that we have a virtual source model, let's apply it to some modern day transistors and see what we can learn. So just a review, we, we have developed a transmission model. We've, in, we've expressed it in virtual source form, but our trans, in our transmission model, the transmission plays an important role in the linear current and in the saturated current. But remember, we have two different transmissions under small drain to source voltage and under large drain to source voltage. Our MVS model is expressed in terms of quantities like injection velocity and apparent mobility. And we can fit this model to measure data and extract those parameters. So the inputs to the MVS model, we need to tell the model the channel length. We need to tell it what the gate capacitance is under strong inversion conditions. There are these empirical parameters, alpha and beta. Remember, they are, they're in the model for the charge that we use to smoothly fit sub-threshold to above threshold. They don't change a lot from transistor to, tra to transistor. Now the outputs, the key outputs that we get from the fitting process are the apparent mobility, the injection velocity, and the series resistance, which is also quite important to know. So the question for this lecture is, what can we learn about carrier transport from these parameters that we extract from the measured data? And to illustrate the approach, I'm going to assume non-degenerate carrier statistics. If you were doing this in practice, you would probably want to be a little more careful and account for the Fermi-Dirac statistics and make use of Fermi-Dirac integrals. So we're going to be looking at a silicon MOSFET at an extremely thin SOI N-channel MOSFET. The, the uh, transistor is described in this paper. You can see the thin channel, the thin, thin ch silicon channel is here. It's about 6.1 nanometers thin. The measured oxide gate capacitance is 1.98 microfarads per square centimeter. The appropriate effective mass for us to use is 0.22 times the electron rest mass. And if we put these numbers in and make use of them, we can compute the unidirectional thermal velocity, and it's 1.14 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. Now, we will also be looking at another 30 nanometer channel length field effect transistor. This transistor is made from a 3,5 semiconductor, indium arsenide. The channel is a very thin indium arsenide layer, and we have some wide band gap 3,5 layers around that to confine the electrons. Uh, this is a high electron mobility transistor, and we'll discuss the physics of this transistor in the next unit. But it is a field effect transistor. It operates by the same physics that our MOSFET does, so we can apply the virtual source to it. The key difference is that the, elect that the electrons have very high mobility in these 3,5 uh, materials. So some of the key parameters for this device, uh, the thickness of that, of that high mobility layer is 5 nanometers. The measured inversion capacitance is given here. The effective mass in 3,5 materials like this is much, much lighter than it is in silicon, about an order of magnitude. And therefore, the unidirectional thermal velocity is significantly larger than it was for the silicon device. All right, let's take a look at measured data and see what we can learn. Here is a, an MVS model fit to the measured data for the 30 nanometer channel length silicon MOSFET. From this fitting process, we can extract an apparent mobility, an injection velocity, and the series resistance. So let's take a look in the linear regime and see what we can learn. We know that in the linear regime, the transmission is mean free path divided by mean free path plus the channel length. You can also easily show that that's the extracted apparent mobility divided by the ballistic mobility, which we can compute for this device. So the ballistic mobility is given by the unidirectional thermal velocity, which we know, and the 30 nanometer channel length that we know. Um, so if we do this analysis, we will, we, will, we will be able to determine the mean free path for backscattering. Well, then we can determine the scattering limited mobility, which is the mobility we would measure in a long channel version of this MOSFET. Well, the extracted apparent mobility was 220. 
centimeters squared per volt second. The computed ballistic mobility is 658. Therefore, we can easily deduce that the transmission is one third. One third of the electrons that are injected from the source travel across the channel and exit from the drain. Okay. We can then put that transmission back in our expression for the transmission in terms of mean free path and deduce the mean, that the mean free path is 15 nanometers. So this 30 nanometer channel length MOSFET is two mean free paths long. Well, we can use that mean free path in this expression for the scattering limited mobility and deduce that the mobility due to scattering is 350 centimeters squared per volt second. This is the mobility that we would deduce if we had analyzed a much longer channel length MOSFET in the same technology. Okay, so that's what we can learn from this analysis. Let's go to the saturated regime and see what we can learn there. Remember that in the saturated region, we have a transmission which is different. It's the same mean free path divided by mean free path plus the length of this bottleneck regime. The injection velocity is related to the transmission and to the unidirectional thermal velocity. So we can use this to deduce from the extracted injection velocity from the fitting process, from the computed unidirectional thermal velocity, we can deduce what this transmission is. And remember, the unidirectional thermal velocity is something that we can compute if we know the effective mass and we know the effective mass. Well, we extract an injection velocity from the fitting process. It's 0.82 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. We compute the unidirectional thermal velocity. That's 1.14 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. And then we can use those two parameters to deduce that we have a transmission of 0.84. Note that the transmission under high VDS is significantly larger than the transmission under low VDS. Right? In, uh, two lectures ago when we were developing the transmission uh, theory, we explained why that was. It occurs because the bottleneck regime that limits the current under high VDS is a small fraction of the channel length, and it's easier for the electrons to get across that very short layer. Well, we can estimate the length of that short bottleneck layer because we, know, we know, now know the transmission. We now know the mean free path from the low VDS analysis, so we can deduce the length of that critical bottleneck regime. So we make use of the deduced transmission, the deduced mean free path, put it in this formula, and we conclude that the length of the bottleneck region is 2.4 nanometers. That's about 8% of the channel length. So bottom line of this analysis, remember we're doing it roughly assuming non-degenerate statistics. The takeaway is that the length of this bottleneck re regime that limits the current under high VDS is about 10% of the channel length, about 10% of the 30 nanometer channel length. Okay, let's do the same kind of analysis for this high electron mobility transistor. So here is the measured data, and here is the corresponding MVS fit to that data. You can see that the fit, again, is excellent. The result of that fitting process gives us an apparent mobility, an injection velocity, and the series resistance of this transistor. So let's, just as we did for the silicon MOSFET, let's look in the linear region first. And in the linear regime, we can easily deduce the transmission because we can extract the apparent mean free path and we can compute the ballistic mobility. And then we can use that to deduce the mean free path for backscattering, and then we can deduce our scattering limited mobility. Well, the extracted apparent mobility for this transistor was 1800. The computed ballistic mobility was 2088. That gives us a transmission that is 0.86. So under low VDS, this transistor is operating quite close to the ballistic limit. Remember that the silicon MOSFET was only one-third in the linear regime. Well, we can then deduce the mean free path for backscattering. It's 187 nanometers. That's significantly longer than the 
channel length itself, which is only 30 nanometers. And then we can deduce the scattering limited mobility. What mobility would we measure in a long channel length version of this transistor? Well, we'd measure over 13,000. That's why this transistor is called a high electron mobility transistor. The, it's made out of materials that have a very high mobility. But you can see that when we build a short channel MOSFET, we lose a lot of the advantages of that extremely high mobility due to ballistic effects. And the mobility that we deduce is substantially lower than the mobility of the material itself. Okay, so that's the linear region analysis. Let's take a look at the saturated regime for this transistor. So our goal then is to deduce the transmission under saturated conditions. Uh, that's related to the injection velocity. It controls the injection velocity. We extract the injection velocity. We can compute the unidirectional thermal velocity, and then we can deduce the transmission. So the extracted injection velocity that came from the fitting to the measured data is 3.5 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second, very high. The computed unidirectional thermal velocity is 3.6 times 10 to the seventh, just a little bit higher. We put that together in our expression for the transmission, and we deduce that the transmission is 98%. Under high VDS, this field effect transistor is operating essentially at the ballistic limit. So again, you'll notice that this, is a, this high electron mobility transistor is operating close to the ballistic limit. Even in the linear regime, it's close. Under the saturated region, it's much closer. So this device, this is an, essentially a ballistic field effect transistor. Well, we can do the similar analysis that we did for the silicon MOSFET and deduce the length for this bottleneck region, the script L. So our deduced transmission was 98%. Our deduced mean free path was 187 nanometers. Putting it in this formula, we deduce that the bottleneck region is 3.7 nanometers long. That's about 13% of the channel length. Again, we conclude, since we're doing a rough analysis here with non-degenerate carrier statistics, we conclude that the bottleneck region is about 10% of the channel. And you know, that's a number that just seems to occur. When we properly designed a field effect transistor for good electrostatic performance, that means low dibble, um, low output, um, conductance, high output resistance, we end up with a bottleneck region that is about 10% of the length of the channel. So a very small portion of the channel is limiting the current under high VDS conditions. So we can summarize silicon versus 3.5. Uh, for the silicon device, we are operating in the quasi-ballistic regime. The transmission under linear conditions is about a third. For the 3.5 hemp, the transmission is uh, you know, close to the ballistic limit. The mean free path for the silicon MOSFET is about half the channel length. The mean free path for the high electron mobility transistor is about, what is that, about six channel lengths long, very long. The scattering limited mobility in silicon is about 350. That's what we would deduce from a long channel version of this MOSFET. The scattering limited mobility for the 3.5 high electron mobility transistor is very, very high, 13, over 13,000. That's the mobility that we would deduce in a very long channel length version of this field effect transistor. The apparent mobility then is significantly lower than the actual mobility for the silicon MOSFET and substantially lower than the scattering limited mobility for the 3.5 transistor. So that makes it hard to really exploit and make use of the full uh, mobility advantage of these high mobility 3.5 materials because ballistic effects become so important at short channel lengths. Under High VDS, 
we deduced the transmissions in both cases, both the silicon MOSFET and the 3.5 high electron mobility trans, uh, transistor operate close to the ballistic limit, the 3.5 hemp essentially at the ballistic limit. And then finally, the injection velocity is a key parameter for device designers because it can, determines how much on current we get. Uh, a little bit less than 1 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second for silicon, 3.5 times 10 to the 7th centimeters per second for the 3.5 hemp, which is a significant advantage if we can maintain the charge, and that turns out to be a, ch a challenge uh, for the 3.5 transistors. All right, if you'd like to dive deeper into analyzing experimental data and see how to do it a little more carefully, I refer you to these references, but the key takeaways, the key messages of these kinds of analysis, we've tried to review in, with these simple analysis that we just did. So, just in summary, the uh, MVS model, the transmission model, provides us with a good way to extract some very important key physical parameters. I need to point out that the MVS model is a model for a good transistor. It's a model for a transistor in which it is well-designed electrostatically so that the virtual source uh, is behaving the way it should. The charge at the top of the virtual source is very close to Vox, uh, Cox times VGS minus VT, and Dibble is small and controlled well. So the MVS model is a good model for well-designed transistors and we can use the model to extract some key physical parameters from these transistors and understand the transport that is going on inside them. Okay, so that brings us to the end of uh, Unit 4, and we've essentially accomplished what we set out to do in this course, understand small MOSFETs. Uh, we'll be talking in Unit 5 about some additional considerations, some ultimate limits, and some other types of transistors. But before we do that, in the next lecture, we'll recap some key takeaways from Unit 4. I'll see you in the next lecture.